All right, today we are going to talk about racism. Uh, we're going to talk about racism. It's Martin Luther King Day. It seems appropriate. Uh, that is, after all, his legacy is fighting racism uh, and, uh, and, and fighting for, for rights and uh, for equal treatment under the law. And uh, that is a legacy, I think, worth celebrating. I mean, not everything Martin Luther King stood for was good, not all of his ideas are worth celebrating, but certainly the struggle for uh, equ equality before the law, certainly the struggle against uh, racism, against Jim Crow, against uh, redlining, against the kind of attitudes were so prevalent to the United States, particularly in the south of the United States during the 1950s and 1960s, that is worth celebrating. So uh, f from that perspective, Martin Luther King certainly is a hero and also, I think, a fighter against racism of, of a different generation and of a uh, really a different kind than, uh, than many of those who claim to be fighting racism today in, in the African-American community and, uh, and elsewhere, not just blacks, but, but, but whites, but generally people who fight racism today are very, very, uh, very different, very different, and we'll talk about that. Um, thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate it. So, uh, you know, obviously today's a good day. Uh, racism has been a topic in the news the last year, certainly since, uh, uh, you know, since the summer when we had uh, the, uh, the, the riots following uh, the death of uh, George Floyd. We had uh, demonstrations, uh, many demonstrations, uh, uh, several of those demonstrations turned into riots. Some of those riots got uh, kind of a life of their own. And in some places like Portland, Oregon, I think they're still going on months and months and months and months after. Um, but all of this started, all of these demonstrations, all of these riots started with the idea of fighting against racism. The, the assumption was that racism is prevalent. We've heard all year long of how uh, systemic racism rules America. Uh, so it's a, it's a good time to reflect back. I did a lot. I talked a lot about, um, about this topic uh, during the summer, but it's been a while. We haven't talked, to it. We haven't talked about it uh, recently, so it's good, to, it's good to do a refresher and bring this back. So why does this issue keep coming up? Why is racism an issue? Why, why, does it, why is it constantly being made an issue? Well, because the fact is that this country has a long and ugly history with racism. Uh, you know, slavery, obviously, for, you know, over 100 years, uh, you know, slavery is not the defining characteristic of the United States as the 1619 Project would assert. Racism is not a sin that wipes out any achievement that is the United States, as many people on the left would argue. But racism and slavery are a black mark on American history. It is uh, the great evil at the founding not an evil big enough to wipe out the great virtues of the founding, but yet a compromise, a moral compromise, a political compromise that led to you know, 80, years of, 80 years of a country that had one of the most evil institutions in human history. I mean, that's been around for most of human history, but yet an evil institution, the institution of slavery, and ultimately led to a civil war with resulted in the death of 600,000 people. So uh, slavery is not just a little issue. Slavery is a major issue in American history and needs to be confronted. And it would be one thing if after slavery, after slavery was abolished, after the, uh, the Civil War, that that was it. The racism had no impact on American history post that, but unfortunately that is not the case. It is the case that 
that, that racism continued to have a profound impact, certainly on parts of the U.S., primarily in the South, but, but really throughout the United States. Redlining as a government policy, not a bank policy, a government policy, was prevalent throughout America, all the way far west as California, Chicago, Detroit to the north, and, and, and many much of the East Coast. Jim Crow laws in the South are true disgrace. They're truly something that should be condemned in the harshest way. You know, businesses that only served whites, while well, they had a right to do it, are despicable and morally despicable and should be condemned as such, but not to mention lynchings, unequal treatment for the law, and a whole host of evils that resulted in the South during, uh, during this period and unfortunately got exported at least to some extent uh, to the North in the early part of the 20th century. So, uh, racism is a part of this country's history. It's a part that cannot be ignored. It's a part that needs to be dealt with. And of course, the 1960s saw a civil rights movement that tried to put an end to legalized, to the, the unequal treatment before the law that Jim Crow and, and racist laws like redlining had uh, brought upon the United States. And to a large extent, it was successful. Those laws were eradicated. Those laws were eliminated. And if anything, one could argue that some of the remedies that were put in place to combat the really systemic government-instituted, government-defended racism in the United States, actually, some of the remedies made, it, made things worse in the long run, actually institutionalized racism. Things like affirmative action, things like the outlawing of any kind of discrimination in private businesses, which have created massive confusion and massive distortion, I think. So the 1960s were a massive success. The civil rights movement was a massive success. And to a large extent, I think the American population over the last 50, 60 years, even in the South, maybe primarily in the South, as individuals have come a long way in changing their attitudes towards racism. Whereas racism in the 1940s, 50s, 60s was open, people were embarrassed or ashamed by it, they were actually proud of it. Most people in modern America would never admit to being racist, even when they are. Racism has become a four-letter word. It becomes something that is morally reprehensible. And people do not admit to being racist. But also, just I think, just people's, as individuals, attitudes towards race have changed. People are far less concerned with issues of race today than they were back when, by, back then. I mean, uh, uh, until the 1960s, it was illegal to have, you know, to, to a, a black woman to marry a black man, a white man, or you know, interracial marriages were illegal. But even in places where they weren't illegal, they were frowned upon. Today, nobody thinks twice about it. Nobody considers it. I mean. Some people do, I know. But for the most part, as a culture, much of the overt racism is gone. And much of the individual racism is gone. Yes, people still make racial slurs. People still slide into different forms of prejudice. But it's nothing like the kind of racism that was so prevalent in decades past. So... We have come a huge way. And one, one of the things that I find disappointing and upsetting and I think uh, um, really harmful to the cause is that people fighting racism today will not acknowledge any of that. They will claim that there's just as much racism today as there was 
60 years ago, that nothing has changed, that we still live in an oppressive white supremacist culture where systemic racism is prevalent everywhere. And that's just nonsense. Much progress has been made. Yes, there's still racism around. Yes, there's still some evidence that even the law doesn't treat everybody the same always. Yes, there are still racists out there, and we'll talk about who those racists are in a little while. And yes, some policemen are probably racist and behave badly. But as a culture, we have come so far. So far. That not to acknowledge that is to undermine and undercut everything that you stand for if you stand against racism. So I think today we have a culture. Put aside kind of, uh, you know, the, 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 the extremes of, of the political culture in America. We have a culture that's generally, overall, come a long way in terms of being less racist, being much more accepting, being much more tolerant. And we moved, particularly in parts of this country, much more towards the goal which is colorblindness. The goal which is not caring about somebody's skin color. Now I've said in the past, I, so let's, let's take a step back a second and define what we mean by racism. Because even there, today, there is massive confusion. Racism is the idea of treating an individual, not treating him not based on his character, not based on his actions, but based on the color of his skin, based on his ethnic origins, based on some unchosen characteristic that has to do with what people term as race. Something to do with his ethic, ethnic, his genetic, his skin color. That is what racism is. It's not inequality. It's not a, some kind of collectivist term. It's a term that applies to an individual who evaluates people based on their membership in a group, a group identified as race. Now, the ideal, now this is evil. Why is this evil? Because it is defining somebody based on something non-essential. Non it is defining some, somebody based on his membership in a group. It is anti-justice because it is not treating the actions, the character of the individual as essential, but treating something that's non-essential, irrelevant, and unchosen, as the basis by which to deal with a person. Now, that is the opposite of justice. That is the essence of injustice. And it is a rejection of the whole idea of individualism, of treating people as individuals, not as members of tribes, not as members of groups, not as members of collectives. Why is the video not on? Wait, 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 wait. wait. So, oh, there it is. It's working. All right. So it's a complete, it's a complete negation of the whole foundation of what this country is based on, the indiv the rights of individuals, the idea that individuals are what matter, and the idea that you. Have a mind, and therefore you shape your own moral character, that you're not evil because of your genes. 
That individuals shape their own character, that individuals make choices, that individuals can think for themselves, that individuals have control over their own lives. That is the basic assumptions of the Enlightenment that made this possible, that made this country possible. And the principles on which this country was based, and more importantly, the principles of an individualistic ethic. Racism negates all that. And, and it is evil because it is unjust, because it is, self, it is corrupting, it is anti your self-interest. It is destructive to you and to everyone around you. All right. So in eradicating racism, what is the goal? Well, in eradicating racism is to, <laughs> is to eradicate that kind of judgment. To stop people using other people's race, genetic, genetics as a standard, as a criteria for evaluation. You want to eradicate racism because you want to live in a just society. You want to live in a society of rational people. You want to, people, you want to live in a society of justice. A society in which the non-essential, in which the unchosen, is not judge morally. You want to live in a society of people who are colorblind. Now, I've said in the past, and I'll say it again, and I, I still believe this, that race in and of itself is an illegitimate concept. They are populations out there that come from different parts of the world. There are people with different skin colors. There are people who have different genetic makeup. There's some groups that have more similarities among them than other groups. But usually, the differences within a group, the differences within a group are greater than the differences between groups. Uh, it, it, there is no way to actually categorize races. I mean, eugenics have tried over and over again. And the more we understand about genetics, the more we know that you cannot do it. Yes, the differences. But there are no hard lines. There are no clear distinctions. There are no clear characteristics. But it seems like the more culture become collectivists, like ours, the more people try to find differences, the more people invest in finding differences, the more people want to emphasize the differences, the more people want to stand by the concept of race, the more people want to proudly proclaim that there is such a thing as race. But it doesn't exist. All that exists are individuals, individuals that have differences because they have different genes. And those genes determine things, certain things about you. Primarily your biology, your genetic makeup is important for your health and for how you look. But it's not important for who you are. It's not important for your moral value. It's not important for the choices you make. It's not important for what you make of yourself. So race to begin with, is a myth. A myth created by people who dislike people who look differently than them. And therefore, the goal of those who actually oppose racism should be to make the case that there is no such thing as race, that all that matters are individuals, that individuals should be judged as individuals. And that we should pay no heed one way or the other to somebody's race. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life 
and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the role of the collectivist brute. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified. Right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.